Okay, Chavra. So, Be'ezrus Hashem. Be'ezrus Hashem. It's a big schus to be part of the Light of the Infinite Conference. Mamish, such a gathering of holy neshamos and holy speakers and such a holy idea to bring Jews together, Kodem Matan Torah, the best preparation imaginable. Be'ezrus Hashem. Please, God, what I'd like to speak about a little bit tonight, the title of the talk is going to be Progress is Perfection. And while it's an idea that rests at the heart of the human experience, it rests at the heart of the religious and the spiritual experience, nevertheless, we're going to connect it in particular to the experience that we're leading ourselves up to now, which is the process of Svira Sa'omer, moving towards the culmination of the Svira process, which is Kabbalah Satora. Kabbalah Satora, the moment where the heavens kissed the earth, the moment where the infinite was revealed, the light of the infinite was revealed, and the people saw and the people heard and the people understood without any possible shade of doubt that the infinite was present in all things and that all things are indicative and expressive of the infinite, which is what it means to live a life of Torah, what it means to live a life of studying Torah, not only studying the texts of Torah, but studying life as Torah itself, making a Birch Torah on life making the decision to make a blessing on waking up in the morning and deciding that today my eyes are going to be the eyes of the world and I am going to interpret reality through the lens of Torah and find HaKadosh Baruch Hu here and find the heavens opening up and find the Koilus and the Brakim and those clarified moments of godly awareness, the the drops, the, the, the quintessential drops that descend from on high into our world that contain the, the essence of the light of the infinite, giving us the ability to taste the future in our days. Now the title of our talk, and the concept, the progress is perfection, is actually a play on words or a play on a phrase that's taken from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was one of, if not the most significant spiritual program developed within the last 200 years in terms of making available the attempt to find comfort in this world, making available the attempt to find transcendence in this world, to experience serenity, to experience a spiritual experience, an opening of the mind beyond the confines of what it typically knew. So in describing how the process works, and describing how the the 12-step process of spiritual development, which can be applied to any individual's life on any circumstances that they find themselves in, it's not relegated towards addiction, or the concept of addiction is not relegated towards those individuals who are addicted, but truly a, a mark of the human condition, which makes the information inherent in these books essential for all human beings, and whatever level they find themselves in. But in describing how it works, in, in describing the essential blockage that blocks an individual from actually embarking upon a path of change, of tshuva, of, of rectifying their stuckness and freeing themselves, not waiting for something outside of this moment, but diving deep into this moment to find the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to find the presence of a higher power as one understands it. So we see over there that in describing the problem of self-interest and egoisms, and again, not arrogance, God forbid. It's not arrogance that we struggle with so much. It's more self-interest. It's more self-obsession that we're stuck with. Most of us nowadays in our spiritual lives have our eyes inverted and and we can't stop looking at ourselves and taking our spiritual temperature our social temperature our the temperature of our presence so it's not arrogance that keeps us locked in on the self but rather it's a certain symptom of what it means to be human to be so obsessed with the self that i i begin to try and impart my will on the world and my will on kadush baruch Hu. And when I try and impart my will, when I try and impart what it is that I desire, what it is that I feel I need, so then I develop the possibility of resentments because the more expectations that I have out of the world in the hopes that it's going to meet me where I stand right now, the more resentments that I build up. As it says in the end of the big book as well, it says that what we've come to find is that our serenity is inversely proportionate with our expectations, meaning the more expectations that we have, the less serenity, and that our acceptance is directly proportionate with our serenity, that the more acceptance we cultivate, the more serenity we have. But when self-will runs amok and the and the self-expression of Anna Emloch, I am going to be king, and that sense of separation and egoism gets so strong, so we begin to desire from the world that it feeds us what we need. And when it inevitably does not, because our will is not the will of the world, it's the will of a Baruch Hu that is the will of the world. 
And when things ultimately fall apart, we begin frustrated and we begin trying to impose certain forms of control over reality. And one of the main forms of control is substantiality, something real, something present, something that I could put my finger on and say it's absolutely real. It's no coincidence that substantiality or substance as described in Spinoza and of the those Jewish thinkers in the stages of the inception of the essential philosophical concepts needed for Kabbalah, Hasidus, and all of the unfolding Jewish spirituality spirituality. When they describe the goal of what we're looking for, it's substance, and it's not a coincidence that it's substance abuse that people find themselves in an attempt to wrestle control from this world. That when my will is no longer being met by the guidelines of reality, so I begin to impose myself and I begin to be frustrated. And in describing the rectification, in describing the process of tshuva, what's described over there, and in texts everywhere, especially at the heart of the of Yiddishkeit, the heart of Panimia Satora, that, that droplet of the Orient Sof that manifests in a textual way, which is the subtotal of the Jewish library, that the antidote is spirituality, the antidote is humility, the antidote is bending oneself to the the recognition or the decision to recognize or the decision to choose to believe to pretend to recognize that all there is is my higher power all that exists is my higher power all that exists is the light of the infinite and not only that but every gesture and every movement that i have in my life is is rooted in the light of the infinite and my actions are not my own actions and my bechira is also a gift from a kadosh baruch Hu. and everything is is saturated with the or ein sof and when a person is able to give themselves over, what they come to realize is that forget about our will for a second and forget about the qualities and the reality of our will and our desires in this world. The essential will and the driving will and the driving desire and light of this world is the will of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And when we get with the will of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, we come to recognize that that is our will. Our own most will is to live comfortably with serenity. And all it takes is to bend our will to the will of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, who also wants us to enjoy serenity. We say at the end of Mincha, at the heart of Shmon Esrei and Mincha and Shabbos, that in truth the quintessential desire that we have in our hearts with regards to avoid the Hashem of being human in this life is menuchas and the true serenity that you God you desire the serenity a serenity of calmness a serenity of pleasantness a serenity of being present the calmness of the spirit and when we come to recognize that in truth his will and our will the will of our higher power and our own wills are ultimately one and the same so at that point all distortion and all concealment runs away but in the all-too-human gesture, the big book speaks also about the fact that what happens when our expectations of spirituality break down? What happens when our desire for perfection simply transmits itself from the realm of substantiality or substance, God forbid, or whatever it might be that a person falls prey to? And what happens when our idols become our spiritual desires? What happens when, okay, so I'll feed my ego with my spirituality, I'll feed my ego with my attempt to come closest to God, but the natural human tendency, the all-too-human tendency, tendency to reify and make objects out of our spiritual quest and to force the higher power of our own understanding, each person according to the own conjecture of their das and their heart, we run the risk of, of making that into the addictive object. We run the risk of demanding perfection from there too. We run the risk of utilizing spirituality as some promise that you know we can be in control over the world. While in truth, the secret of the Orient Sof, the secret of the Bittal associated with spirituality is coming to recognize that we're not in control at all. And so as a warning sign to this natural descent into this desire for perfection in the spiritual realm, for this desire to actually grasp in one way or another in an actualized way the infinite light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as if the human mind were capable of grasping something in its limited mindset and it's the, the, the restrictions of the mind. So what the, the members of this of this group of individuals seeking redemption, seeking recovery, seeking tshuva, seeking a return to that hasaga of the Orient Sof in each and every person's level, they add that at best we can do is try our best. At best we can do is try our best. We seek spiritual progress and not perfection. We seek spiritual progress and not perfection. Our job here in this world is not to perfect something, but it's to simply be in the process. Now what I want to do is I want to take Hasidus and add a little bit to this teaching from the Big Book. Because what the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous describes is that we seek spiritual progress and not perfection. 
And it could be that the typical reading of that is, ideally we would like spiritual perfection. Who doesn't want perfection? Everything needs to be perfect. But because we can't hold ourselves to such standards, so we will settle as the consolation prize of spiritual progress, as if the ideal would be spiritual perfection. But the reality of the scenario is that it's only spiritual progress, and it's our job to accept that and humble ourselves in the face of it and accept our imperfections. That's the typical way of reading such a description, that ideally we want perfection, we want to grasp everything, we want to be able to have full control over everything, we want to say that we can grasp and name the infinite and make it measurable. We can't, so we might as well be satisfied with progress. What Hasidus teaches and what Panemius Athera teaches is Adaraba. That's also true, that we can't have perfection. And we're not strong enough to reach perfection sometimes. And we all need Tahara and Kedusha. And we all need to remove ourselves, as Rabbi Nachman says, ever so slightly from the entrapment and the and the quagmire of this worldly experience. And every nituk shana atak, every gesture and uplifting that an individual engages in in this world is considered to be the essential purpose of the entirety of reality. So that's true. That way of reading the big book of progress and not perfection, progress being the consolation prize for the impossibility of perfection due to human constriction, progress is also true. A person needs to have progress, and a person also has to idealize the concept of perpetual growth. But what Panimia Satoru teaches is something different. It's not just the consolation prize, that since you can't have perfection, you might as well settle for progress. In Panimia Satora, in the, in the secret traditions that we're tapping into in this, wondrous cons in this wondrous gathering, in this wondrous conference, this wondrous generation gathering together to, to, to taste of the secretion of that infinite light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that rests deeply nested within the innermost point of our hearts and our minds, the secret is, it's not just that it is progress because perfection is not possible, the perfection is found in progress. That the only possibility of perfection is the concept of progress. And that progress and the imperfection of the human being is not some symptom of some primordial fall that shattered the human experience and threw it into a post-lapsarian state that needs to rectify itself through suffering, etc but rather to believe that in truth the human being is by nature imperfect, that the constitutive element of what it means to be human being in this world, to be a nivra, to be something created from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, to be not God, to not be the infinite light of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, to not be the creator of all things. The essential spiritual goal is to come to recognize that perfection is an impossibility, not because of a deficiency, but because that's what it means to be human. Because for a human being to claim the possibility of perfection is to conceive of the unimaginable concept of being on the same level playing field as the ultimate perfection, which is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Echad Yachad Miyuchad, the Hayahoi Vaviyya, the singular, the unified, and the one, the, that which was in the past, that which is in the present, and that which will be in the future. Echad Yachad Miyuchad, Hayahoi Vaviyya, that's the only perfection in the world. That's the Shlema Sa'amiti. That's the only capital E essential thing in the world. That's the only capital T truth in the world. Everything else is contingent. Everything else is dependent. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Torah, the Jewish people. They're singular. Everything else in the world is dependent. And therefore, if we're dependent, then impossibility of perfection is not a symptom, but it's the reality. It's the reality. And chas v'shalom for a person to come to think that perfection isn't even a possibility. And so when we foreclose on the possibility of perfection due to the very nature of the fact that we're human beings, not because we've fallen, but because that's what it means to be a nivra, to humbly submit ourselves to the recognition that I cannot be perfect, and that is where I uncover my perfection. When I accept my chisaron, when I makir my nikudas chisaron, when I identify with the constitutive lack that rests at the core of my being, which gives birth to the desire and the yearning and the chuka of the neshama to grasp that which it doesn't have, that in and of itself is a taste of spiritual perfection. And that in truth, the highest level that we can possibly come to in our spiritual quests is the level where we recognize that we know absolutely nothing. As Rabbi Nachman ben Fega, Schusi Aleinu, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, our tzaddik, our teacher, our guide, as Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says, that tach, in the name of the Rishonim, that tachlis hayadiyah shaloneda, that the essential purpose of creation, the essential purpose of human experience is to come to a recognize that I don't know anything, that I can't know. 
And this is not a negation of the, the purpose of knowledge, but rather this is an upholding of knowledge in its truest sense. That tachlis idea, the most important and essential thing for me to know, to know intuitively, to learn in every single level of my existence and my experience. Every single part of my fiber should come to know that I don't know. It's not an ignorant not knowing. It's a, a positive assertion of knowing that I don't know, of knowing how big HaKadosh Baruch Hu is and how limited I am. And in that moment, we come to uncover the perfection that rests within imperfection and the fact that to be a human being means to be in a perpetual process of progress, in a perpetual process of progress, of moving ever slightly so forward, of moving from one level to the next. And when we reach the ceiling of the level that we're at, we come to recognize that in truth, in relationship to the next level, that ceiling is merely the floor of the next spiritual level. And that after we've come to the 49 days of Omer and we've prepared ourselves in, in the 49 levels of counting one, two, three, four, and moving forward gradationally and sequentially and, and believing that we can grasp the essence, what we come to find is the Shah Hanun, the level 50, which is the secretion of the Orient Sof into reality and into our minds, which is the recognition that everything is infinite and I know absolutely nothing. The Shah Hanun, the highest grasp, which the Vilna Gon says is inaccessible as well as accessible is the secret of knowing that I can't know. The highest level of understanding is that perfection is only found in progress, in that inherent imperfection. Not an imperfection that comes from weakness, but an imperfection that comes from the strength of recognizing that I am a Bria, I am created. I am created, yesh mei'ayin, ex nihilo, something from nothing at every moment, which means that there is something bigger than me that is creating me at every moment. And in that recognition of not knowing, in that recognition of not being able to be perfect, of being built the shalem, I come to understand the secret of the 50th gate. Chazal tell us, the tzaddikim tell us, that there were 50 gates of understanding that were engraved and revealed in reality. Now those 50 gates of understanding are ontological mechanisms through which HaKadosh Baruch Hu reveals himself in the world, but what they are also are pathways of the mind, 50 ways of contemplating reality, thinking ways of thinking about the self, thinking about HaKadosh Baruch Hu and my presence as a phenomenologically aware creature in this reality, in this low, broke-down place of Olam HaAsiyah, of the darkness that is doubled over itself, that the concealment that is concealed within itself, that is the belly of the snake is all of the tzaddikim say, that my conscious awareness down here is also seen through those 50 levels of understanding. And in contradistinction to the 32 pathways of Chachma, which are mere, not merely, but they're more cognitive intellectual processes, the 50 gates of understanding are much more rooted, as the Zohar HaKadosh says, the Book of Splendor describes that Bina understanding is rooted in the heart, and the heart understands, because it's the birthplace of emotional thinking. Now, emotions are obviously a, a fundamental element of the mind itself, but they're emotional feelings. It's visceral. Bina is more susceptible to separation as well as to giving birth to novelty. And so the Torah says, Chazal tell us that those 50 gates were given over to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, who was the tzaddik of all tzaddikim, who is the tzaddik of all tzaddikim, is the one that we're waiting for, is the emergence of Mashiach, is the emergence of that Hasaga of the Or Sof, because Moshe Rabbeinu was the, the greatest imaginable creature ever created, but Moshe Rabbeinu was specifically the one to come to teach us that I cannot see you and live. The Leshem Shabbat HaChalema says, why is it that we learn this from Moshe? Because if we learned it from any other person, we may have thought that our natural and inherent imperfection was due to some punishment, some negative behavior. And as a result of our inequity, as a result of our breakdown in, in functioning, that's why we're not zilcha to perfection. That's why we're not zilcha or meritorious of grasping the face. But the Leshem says we learn it specifically through Moshe Rabbeinu because there was nobody greater than Moshe Rabbeinu. And if anybody could have been perfect, it was Moshe Rabbeinu who could have been perfect. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes along and says, Ki lo ha'adam b'chai, that no human being can see me and live. No human being can grasp perfection. No human being can have anything but progress. And the Lashem Shavah V'chalama writes, and I'll say the Hebrew first, that that it is written into reality. It is a deeply held ontological truth at the core of all of existence that it is an impossibility for the creation to grasp the essence of the Creator. And therefore, our inherent imperfection is our experience of Bina 
is how we understand things in this world. Chazal used the language of bina miklal de ta'a. Oh, you understand? What that implies is that you previously had been mistaken. That being mistaken and understanding are not two separate experiences, but rather two sides of the very same coin of of the noida b'shar and bala, the the subjective, emotional, visceral relationship with God that only I have, and that nobody else in the history of existence, in the past, present, or future, will ever have. And each and every one of us has to be able to say that. And these fifty gates were given over to Moshe, but Chazal describe it in a very strange language. They say. That nun share bina nivru uba'olam, there were 50 gates that were created in the world. And those 50 gates were all given over to Moshe, chasar achas, lacking one. And the implication again being that all he could have was 49. He couldn't have come to the 50th gate. But when we pay attention to the language and the linguistic expression that Chazal in their infinite wisdom utilized to describe this concept, they don't say that there were 50 gates created and Moshe only received 49 of those gates. It says that 50 gates were created and Moshe received all 50 gates, chasar achas, deficient one. And one can read it as follows, that the 50th gate is the recognition that I am deficient, that all of the gates were given to Moshe Rabbeinu, but the 50th gate, the highest level of understanding, was the recognition that I continue to be deficient even when I reach the highest level. As the Holy Baal Shem Tov has taught us, that when a person reaches the 50th gate, what they come to recognize is that there's another 49 gates that exist that exist above them, and another 49 gates, ad infinitum, because what we're trying to grasp is the or ein sof, it's an infinite thing, and the finite cannot be infinite by dint of the fact that it's finite. And therefore, our job is to come to terms, to recognize, to be mitmodeid, to pay attention to, and find HaKadosh Baruch Hu within our own most limitation. And when we grasp HaKadosh Baruch Hu in our own most limitation, not an acceptance and a progress that negates the desire to move forward, because we always need that, that force. We need the self and the bittal and the nothingness at once. We have to be perpetually moving forward in a state of progress towards perfection, yet continuously retreating back into ourselves in recognition and acceptance of the fact that we can't have perfection. And in that moment, a person is able to taste the light of perfection within progress itself. This is what our rabbis meant when they would take leave from one another and they said, you should see your world in your days. You should allow your mind to be irrigated by the perpetual, never not undulating flow of the river that stems forth from Gan Eden, which is perpetually watering our minds and giving us access to al Asi, to the world to come that exists not outside of us necessarily, but internally as well. Both are true, externally and internally, and I can taste that now, and I can taste the, the drip drop of the Or Ein Sof as it reveals itself in my life. To end just with a Maisa, one of my favorite Maisim, one of my favorite tales, there was a student of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, and his name was Rav Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. He was known as the Vitebsker. And aside from being one of the biggest tzaddikim to have lived, he was also somebody who was lovesick and intoxicated with a desire for Eretz Yisrael to the extent that he moved to the land of Israel and he settled the land and he cultivated the divine awareness of the Baal Shem Tov, a project that was born in the broke-down forests of Ukraine, in those dark, dark places, those dark mountains, and the Vitebsker wanted to reveal it in the Holy Land of Israel. And not only in the Holy Land of Israel, but the Vitebsker felt that it was necessary to settle in that watery space of Tiberia, that, that holy, purified, rarefied space of northern Israel where the water is clear and pristine and it gives birth to all sorts of clarified experiences and to those drops of the Or Ein Sof, or what is referred to elsewhere, not the light of the infinite, but Mei Mei Ein Sof, the drops the waves of the infinite. And the Vitebsker was in the town of Tiberia, and there was an excitement that came out in, in the streets. And the students had announced, because they had heard someone claim that Mashiach had arrived, that the Redeemer had arrived, that redemption had arrived, that, that calmness had arrived, that the willingness to be okay had arrived. And they came naturally to their master. They came knocking on the Vitebsker's door. And they said, Rebbe, Rebbe, teacher, teacher, master, master, the Messiah has arrived. Redemption is here. Tell us, is it true? Should we get ourselves dressed and prepared? prepared to go. And the Vitebsker, in a very calm and, and serene way, the Vitebsker stood up very slowly from his chair where he had been studying, and he walked over to the window. He opened up the window, and he smelled the scent of the air, and he looked back into his students, and he said, Mashiach has not arrived. Mashiach is not here. 
And he sat back down, and in truth, it had turned out that it was a false alarm, and the Messiah had not arrived. The students returned back to their master a few days later, and they said, Master, pray tell, we believe you inherently. We know that the Messiah had not arrived because you said so. But tell me, why was there a need for you to smell outside? Why couldn't you have told us it from where you were sitting? And the Vitebsker looked at his students and he says, because where I'm sitting, the Messiah has already arrived. Where I'm sitting, redemption is already here. Because there's a way of living if we learn to accept the progress and not the perfection. We give ourselves the ability to find perfection within the progress. Yismach lev mevakshay Hashem, gladdened is the heart of those who seek after God. The tzaddikim ask a question. Typically joy emerges by acquisition, not by seeking. But rather, it's exactly what we've been saying. When it comes to spiritual matters, it's about the desire towards acquisition, the desire towards perfection. And that desire is not consolatory. It's not a second place prize. What our tzaddikim, what our tradition teaches us, what the infinite light of a Baruch Hu and the light of the infinite expression of a Baruch Hu teaches us is that to, to have by way of yearning, to hold it by way of desire, to touch and not touch at once. And in that way, we can prepare ourselves to come close to the mountain while staying away from the mountain, recognize that the, clo the more we think we can be on the mountain is the farther we are from the mountain, and to recognize that there's nothing more whole than a broken heart because we come to recognize that we're imperfect, and that imperfection is the birthplace of faith and humility and anava and dveikos and, and bitl and all of the wonderful things that we have access to in our generations through the, the amazing people like Erez, who are putting this together and the spiritual influences that, that are part of this remarkable renaissance of the holy and um, and Ezra Sashem, with the help of God, we should merit uh, really receiving the Torah, experiencing the 50th gate, coming to a place of recognizing that all that exists is God, all that is real is God, and that I can relax and I can let myself go for a little bit and I can accept the fact that per per perfection is not the goal and I can find happiness in my part as well, God willing.